All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. This is Bernane Lloyd from Northwatch. And uh, we are here this afternoon with uh, Dr. M. V. Ramana from the Liu Institute of Global Issues uh, with the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And our presentation topic this afternoon is SMRs and Canada. And uh, we're going to begin now, and everyone is muted, and I will unmute uh, at the end of the session. Please, if you have a, a question or a comment, if you could raise it during the session uh, in the chat function. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramana. Thank you, Brennan. Thank you all for listening to me. Um, I want to start by apologizing because of a slight cold, so my voice may not be entirely clear. And um, I also didn't manage to go into my office in advance, so you'll hear a little bit of construction noise near my apartment window. Just want to apologize for that in advance. And also in advance for my dog, which might suddenly call for attention. Uh, she doesn't like my talking to other people when she's there. Um, anyway, thank you again. Uh, so um, my uh, focus in this talk is to sort of explain a little bit about small modular nuclear reactors uh, and come to one of the, uh, what's happening in Canada, what's my sense of what's happening in Canada with the SMR industry and to present some preliminary results and that of some research that me and a couple of collaborators here have been doing on looking at the potential market and the costs of uh, small modular reactors for uh, remote communities and uh, mines, uh, which is one of their selling arguments. Okay, let's get started. So I thought I would start by explaining why uh, the industry, the nuclear industry is talking about small modular reactors. Uh, just, there's been sort of waves of this uh, talk about SMRs uh, since at least the 1980s. And in fact, there's a sort of, there was an earlier generation of small reactors that used to be um, uh, talked about in the 1950s and 60s. But I think the current uh, push comes from the fact that uh, the state of nuclear power around the world is not very promising. Uh, so you all know this, but I'll just very quickly sort of walk through this according to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, there are about five, 453 reactors operating in about 31 countries. Um, I say about 31 because it also includes Taiwan, which is not included as a country. And the number 453 also has to be taken with a pinch of salt because the IAEA relies on information that's given to it by different countries. So if you look at the blue arrow there pointing to Japan, according to the Japanese government, it has 41 reactors or 42 reactors operating right now. However, in actual fact, most of them are not operating. As you know, many of them were shut down after the Fukushima accidents and they have not been uh, restarted. So um, the more uh, accurate figure uh, is, um, put out by uh, Michael Schneider and Anthony Frogart, who bring out the annual uh, World Industry Status Report. And it's somewhat fewer than 453, it's more like 410 to 415 reactors that are operating today. Excuse uh, me, Ramana, excuse me. Uh, we're not seeing the slides change at our end. Oh, did you, did you not see, are you on slide four? No, no we're oh, still on one. slide one. Hold on, there's something funny happening here. Oh, okay, so, uh, okay. Can you hit, so I'm trying to share and it seems to have been paused and I'm not able to click resume share. I, I don't seem to have control over my screen here. Okay, let me see. So now I'm viewing, let's try now. Um, Okay, let me just see again. There's no share. There we go. Excellent. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Now I can't see my slides because the, the Zoom group chat is right in center of my screen. We now see the blue uh, the blue chart uh, saying right. nuclear reactors and net operating capacity. That's right. Okay, that's the right one to see. Hold on one second. I'm unable to also. Okay, so I'm. Okay, on this right side of my window, there's a screen that has everybody's name and including my picture. 
and I'm unable to get that to go away. So there's, if you, if you put your mouse over that, okay. um, then uh, it'll give you different options in terms of uh, showing and on the left hand side, hide thumbnail video. If you click on that. Nope, nope it doesn't do that for me. Okay, can you see now? Uh, yeah, we're back to the blue slide. Okay, good. So it's, you know, as of the end of uh, 2018, um, uh, the uh, World Nuclear Industry Status Report counts 413 reactors as operating as opposed to the IAEA's number. But that, that exact number is kind of not relevant, just shows that the number of reactors that have been operating has been fairly constant over the last about maybe 20 to 30 years. It's gone up a little bit, but not by much. Um, there has been a lot of talk about a nuclear renaissance uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And you can kind of see here uh, the figures for how many reactors were under construction at the beginning of each year. Uh, and what you can see is that the number of reactors kind of, uh, uh, the construction of uh, reactors sort of got, went up starting around 2008 and peaked uh, around uh, 2013 and has started declining. And much of this is really due to what's happening in China. And China at one point was uh, embarking on a lot of nuclear uh, construction and that trend seems to be changing. Uh, all signs are that uh, the Chinese uh, leadership has uh, decided that they are not going to be uh, trying to make all these grandiose plans and build a huge number of reactors as was the case previously. There are still many uh, powerful forces within China that try to have, are trying to change this. So this is not something which you can be sure about, but at the same time, there are plenty of indications for reasons which I can go into during the Q&A to suggest that the big Chinese boom is kind of uh, fading at this point. Uh, the net result of all this is that the share of uh, nuclear energy of the global electricity market has been declining continuously. So it's the maximum it ever was, was in 1996, when it was 17.6%. And uh, it has declined to just a little bit over 10%. Uh, and that decline has been fairly monotonic and smooth. Uh, and if you look sort of towards the future, um, projections by there are a number of agencies that put out annual projections of what the energy future might look like uh, a one that i track is the international atomic energy agency because it's focused on nuclear energy and so every year the iaea puts out uh, its estimates for how much nuclear capacity and market share um, nuclear power would have uh, for the years 2030 and 2050 and in this graph, what you see are their projections uh, as published in the years 2010 uh, up to the last year. And what you see there is that um, after 2010 and essentially the Fukushima accident happened, and you can see a, a, a sort of gradual decline in terms of projections uh, for the future. Uh, what's important is not these projections per se, uh, because the IAA's projections have usually not come true. Uh, but what's important is that even if uh, the upper projection is realized, uh, the market share of nuclear energy will remain roughly the same. It'll be about 10 to 12 percent. So if you're thinking about nuclear energy as a, a contributor to climate mitigation, the only way that can happen is if nuclear energy becomes a bigger and bigger share of the electricity market and that even the most optimistic projections don't see happening at this point. Uh, in reality, of course, it's probably going to decline even further. And the reason it's declining is less because uh, reactors are shutting down, though that's also happening, but because uh, countries are building up uh, capacity of other sources of uh, electricity generation, uh, including uh, gas, including uh, wind and uh, solar energy around the world. Could I, could I just interject that 10% of electricity is less than 2% of global energy, and I think it's important to point out to people that this is really a much smaller percentage of global energy. You're right. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 
All right. Um, so uh, some of this, of course, the decline is due to the uh, accidents at uh, Fukushima. Um, I won't go into that now, but um, the accident has changed uh, a number of things. But what it has not changed is that the bulk of the countries that have uh, large nuclear capacities, the governments continue to be pushing nuclear power. Uh, so that includes the United States, China, India, France, a whole bunch of countries. At some level, the, uh, they are all in, um, intent on trying to expand nuclear power at some level. But um, nevertheless, if you look at uh, how uh, national targets have changed, uh, if you, I've here uh, tabulated the targets of, for nuclear power in these different countries by official agencies um, and show that all of them have declined between 2010 and 2015. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but just to give you this general trend that ev even though these are countries where the governments would like to maintain uh, nuclear power as an important energy source, uh, the expectations are that it is going to decline. All right, and the primary problem uh, which uh, is confronting the industry, uh, in my opinion, that sort of uh, stopping the growth of nuclear energy has been uh, economics. Um, and uh, many of you know, for example, that if you look at cost uh, in electricity generation cost uh, estimates around the world, uh, nuclear tends to be among the highest. So this is the plot of uh, electricity generation, both the construction cost and the generation cost. Uh, so the cost per um, installed kilowatt uh, or hour of kilowatt of capacity and the generation cost for each megawatt hour of electricity. And you find that nuclear on the sort of extreme left is the, the highest uh, for, this is only for the United States. Uh, this was put out by a Wall Street advisory company called Lazard. Um, and um, you can see that the uh, really cheap ones at this point uh, are solar photovoltaics at sort of the utility scale, not the uh, photovoltaics that one might install on one's roof. Um, and uh, so wind uh, onshore. Uh, nuclear tends is the, um, uh, the highest, both in terms of the construction cost and in terms of the generation cost. Right? So this is the, uh, the second thing which we have seen between um, the uh, beginning of the so-called nuclear renaissance and now has been a trend that we've seen earlier as well in the nuclear industry, which is of uh, significant cost increases. So all the major uh, reactors that are under construction in many different countries have seen spectacular increases in costs, uh, most spectacularly in the United States and in Western Europe. So uh, the last thing which I want to say is that for a long time, uh, what the nuclear industry used to say was that, yes, we know nuclear power plants are expensive to build uh, and they are high capital costs, but once you construct them, they are cheap to operate because they don't require a lot of uranium, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, scenario has changed in the last uh, about a decade or less, uh, as what we see is that more and more reactors in uh, those uh, electricity markets that are uh, deregulated and open to competition where electricity is traded like a commodity, what you find is that many uh, reactors are shutting down because their marginal cost, just the cost of generating each additional megawatt hour of electricity is too high compared to the alternatives that are there on the market. In the United States, these alternatives are primarily natural gas and renewables, solar and wind. Uh, in other countries, it could be in Sweden, for example, it's hydro and so on and so forth. So this is the economic situation that the nuclear industry finds itself in. Uh, and uh, the one uh, stream of response has been to try and get states uh, to subsidize the nuclear industry. That's what one thing that's been happening in the United States uh, in one state after the other. Uh, but the other uh, response has been to say, you know, can uh, new reactor designs, and these go under different names, uh, advanced reactors, generation four reactors, small modular reactors, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here I'm going to sort of focus on this so-called small modular reactors. So before we go into the, just a two very quick 
uh, definition. So when they mean small, it means that the capacity for electricity generation is small, less than 300 megawatts. That's the kind of definition. The International Atomic Energy Agency sometimes uses the same um, uh, acronym SMR to mean small and medium scale reactors. Uh, for in the medium is defined as reactors that generate between 300 and 700 megawatt electric. The term modular uh, has again two uh, kinds of meanings. Uh, the primary meaning is coming from uh, the manufacturing sector where there is this new uh, uh, idea that the high cost of nuclear power plants is because a lot of the construction of the old plants happen at the field site uh, where there is less control over all the different logistical elements that need to come together in order to construct something as big and complex as a nuclear reactor. And so the idea that has been uh, taking um, uh, uh, faith in the industry is that if only we could move a lot of this construction into the factory, then things are going to be much uh, easier. And so the idea for SMRs is that you will have factory fabricated modules. Each module is a portion of a finished plant, uh, larger or smaller, depending on the design. Uh, and these things would just be manufactured in factories uh, on a sort of industrial scale um, in an assembly line. And then they would just be sent off to the specific sites where a reactor could be constructed. And these would just be put together. And so a lot of the construction effort gets trans uh, transmit, um, transposed to the uh, factory uh, site. Um, and uh, the SMRs are not the only ones which try to push this uh, argument. The other um, uh, major reactor design that has uh, tried to use modularity to control costs has been the AP1000 reactor that Westinghouse uh, constructed. Uh, both in uh, southern United States and in China. And uh, as we all know, that experience was not very promising. Uh, both uh, the, the, uh, the Chinese uh, reactors uh, experienced cost and uh, time delays. And in the United States, one uh, construction project was entirely canceled. The other one has been extremely expensive. So modularity is not going to be the kind of silver bullet that solves anything, but that doesn't stop the industry from saying this is what the answer is going to be. <clears throat> the um, main, uh, so given that the uh, economics has been the challenge to nuclear power, uh, how can SMRs change the picture? Uh, the, main are, the main problem, um, that, the reason why nuclear uh, reactors today are as large as they are typical nuclear reactors uh, range between 700 to 1500 megawatts. Uh, and you're talking about reactors which are about half or a fifth as small as these large reactors. The reason why nuclear reactors, which originally started off being small, became bigger and bigger over the decades is because they try to uh, get what are called economies of scale. Uh, the fact is, if you want to generate two times as much power, you don't necessarily require twice as much concrete or stainless steel or need twice as many workers. But if you have a reactor that generates twice as much power, in principle, you get twice as much revenue. And so that's the uh, argument for um, increasing the uh, reactor size. So SMRs, in a sense, are going backwards. Uh, and so they are going to lose out on uh, the what are called economies of scale. And so they're going to be more expensive on a per uh, unit capacity, on a per kilowatt basis, as compared to large reactors. That is, of course, only if the designs are exactly the same. Uh, you can then define it through this equation, which I've put on the right, uh, which is usually the ratio of the capital cost is the ratio of the um, output powers to the power 0 0.6. Uh, the 0 0.6 is just an empirical rule of thumb that uh, people derive from looking at uh, the industry. Now, what the SMR industry says is, yes, we know that, uh, but they have two arguments against it. First, they would say, our reactor designs are quite different from the reactors which are being constructed. They are much simpler and so on and so forth. That's a little difficult argument to uh, address. Uh, in any quantitative fashion because we don't know what the designs are. We don't know what the experience of construction of these reactor designs are. 
But the second argument that they make, which is more common, is that uh, it's true that we might have a little bit higher cost in the beginning, but because these are smaller, you'll be constructing many more of them. And as you keep constructing them, you will gain, um, uh, you will have learning and you will be able to reduce costs because you figure out what is the cheapest way to do various things. Um, and this is often described by this equation on the right by some what they call a learning parameter or a learning rate, which is how much uh, reduction in cost you happen happens when you increase the number of reactors that you're operating by a certain amount. And what uh, some of the calculations we did when I used to be in Princeton showed that if you have to have the second factor compensate for the first, then the number of reactors that would have to be constructed run to several hundreds to maybe several tens of thousands, depending on what you assume to be the learning rate, what you assume to be the smaller and the larger sizes and so on and so forth. So these are just sort of heuristic numbers to give you a sense of how many reactors would have to be constructed if the uh, nuclear industries, SMR industries arguments were to be taken at face value and you just assume that it is going to happen the way they think it is. But even under the best possible circumstances, you are talking about uh, tens, hundreds, maybe tens of thousands of reactors. Uh, if you look at how ex what experts say, they typically say, you know, we don't, uh, you know, if you uh, put them in a room and say, what do you think is going to be the real cost? They typically expect that um, SMRs are going to end up being more expensive than large light water reactors, which are themselves, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, economically uncompetitive today. So SMRs are going to be even more uncompetitive. The other thing which I want to say about economics is that, uh, as we have mentioned earlier, uh, today the nuclear industry in the United States uh, and in Western Europe is facing a problem of just uh, trying to recoup its operational maintenance cost and fueling costs. And these are also influenced by economies of scale. Uh, there's a limit to how few operators can operate um, a reactor. You would certainly want a certain number to be uh, there in order to ensure safe operations and so on and so forth. So uh, this is why you see that uh, both in the United States and Canada and elsewhere, uh, SMR vendors and other promoters are seeking changes in regulations on allowing reductions in the number of operators, in the security preparations, emergency planning, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is something which is going to definitely affect the safety characteristics of these reactors. Um, in general, um, I also would say that SMRs will have to deal with, apart from safety risks, also environmental risks in terms of production of radioactive waste, uh, and uh, security risks because of the link to uh, nuclear weapons. These are the problems that many in the, uh, associate with nuclear power plants anyway in the industry. What uh, we have shown in some research that I did some years ago with my colleague Zia Mian, uh, was that uh, these different um, priorities, uh, lower risk of accidents, less production of radioactive waste and so on, those uh, 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 priorities do not translate into the same kind of technical design. Uh, in other words, uh, one trying to deal with one problem will might accentuate the other problems. Uh, and there's no one design that's going to meet all the desirable criteria at the same time. In specifically, uh, one of the issues that we all talk about, uh, we're concerned about is uh, nuclear waste production. What we showed uh, in some other research was that when you consider SMRs based on the light water reactor design, the uh, ones which are expected to be uh, licensed earliest, in, especially in the United States, uh, the one design that's uh, up on the uh, regulator's horizon is new scale. Uh, these will require more uranium per kilowatt hour and generate more nuclear waste uh, per kilowatt hour uh, compared to large reactors. The Canadian case is a little different because the Canadian fleet is largely based on heavy water reactors, which generate more waste, but of, uh, with lower radioactive uh, content in them because they have lower burn-ups compared to um, light water reactors. <coughs> okay, so let me just move on very quickly to uh, the market outlook for SMRs before I come to the case in Canada. 
the idea when you're talking about modular uh, construction uh, is that uh, if you want to set up a factory and uh, manufacture these reactors in large numbers, then you need what the, what the industry calls a full order book, that you need to know that there are going to be uh, utilities that are going to buy all the reactors that you're going to construct. So it's like trying to set up a car factory. Unless you know there are people who are going to buy a car, many, many people are going to buy cars. There's no point in putting up, putting up the money to set up the factory. Um, and uh, what's been the record so far? So in the United States, there were two uh, companies that were given funding by the US Department of Energy to advance their designs. Uh, the first was um, Babcock and Wilcox. Uh, the, um, uh, they had something called the Empower Reactor. And the second one was New Scale. Uh, and what's more interesting than New Scale is actually thinking about what happened to Babcock and Wilcox, which is that a couple of years after they got funding from the DOE, they essentially slashed all their funding on their SMR project and um, laid off um, most of their staff, including their CEO, uh, who then moved to Canada and is now heading uh, a company that uh, is trying to sell nuclear fusion energy. That's a different story. Uh, but the ma main point they said was that um, uh, Babcock and Wilcox, after getting funding from the DOE, went around trying to find investors in their company or customers who are willing to contract so they can go ahead with uh, continued R&D and they just drew a blank, essentially. Now, uh, this is somewhat different from uh, the case of um, uh, New Scale, uh, because for New Scale, they don't have any other products. Babcock and Wilcox is a whole range of other products, and therefore they just decide we are going to focus on those other things. The SMR thing, they just put on a back burner. The same is the case for uh, Westinghouse, uh, which for many years uh, has uh, pursued SMRs, one um, called the Iris Design, then the Westinghouse SMR. And again, in 2014, once they found out they were not getting funding from the DOE, um, moved away from SMRs uh, and focused its efforts on AP1000 and gaining new decommissioning contracts. And we know how the AP1000 reactor is doing, business is doing not so well. Uh, but what is more important is that the CEO at that point said, uh, the problem I have with SMRs is not the technology, it's not the deployment, it's that there's no customers, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's the case in the United States. Uh, around the world as well, uh, uh, many developing countries have been uh, talked about as potential markets, but in uh, some case studies that we did, we found that none of these potential customer countries are actually buying reactors. They talk about SMRs, they talk about, oh, how interesting it is, it'll be great if we have a light one, a small one, but when it comes to actually spending money, uh, they're not really doing that. Okay, now let me quickly turn to Canada. Uh, you're all sort of more familiar, many of you must be more familiar with this than I am, but I will just say what I do know. Uh, so for the last several years, there has been talk about interest in SMRs, uh, uh, from different uh, entities around the country. Uh, and um, an important player in this has been uh, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, and for the last several years, uh, they have been saying many SMR vendors have been um, expressed interest in deploying SMRs in Canada. And they want to figure out how CNSC is going to regulate these activities. Now, uh, my sense is that uh, CNSC is also actively quoting uh, potential uh, um, vendors to come there, uh, and they are basically setting themselves up as a contrast to the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which has a set of standard uh, prerequisites for any design to be uh, licensed. Uh, and my sense is that uh, CNSC is sort of saying, we have a more flexible approach and we can sort of give you an initial uh, look over of your design and kind of give you a, a green signal or a red signal. Uh, and that you can then use as a way to say, oh, look, our design has been uh, partially, you know, has, has received initial approval from a regulatory agency. And that's a good talking point for them. Um, the other important player in this has been Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. And in 2017, as you know, uh, they uh, began a, a kind of a discussion and they asked for input and a whole bunch of companies said, oh, what a great idea this is going to be uh, to have SMRs uh, in Canada. And they, the next year they bought out a, a big report. 
uh, called Perspectives on SMR Opportunity. And when that report was published, uh, the president and CEO basically said, you know, uh, this is what it, this the, uh, Canada is the place for you guys to be in, and we are going to be your partners. And again, my guess is that CNL has nothing really up uh, to do, uh, and therefore this is the one market opportunity that they see for themselves. Uh, and again, one of, some of you might know much more about this. Uh, I'm also seeing more um, efforts at trying to make. SMR seem more palatable as opposed to nuclear reactors in general. So recently there was a poll put out uh, by the Canadian Nuclear Association uh, basically saying 87% of Canadians support or are open to small modular reactors. Okay. Um, now, you know, polls are polls. You can sort of uh, figure out what they must have told the uh, people who are taking the poll and then that um, uh, biases what answer you get. But nevertheless, I, I see this as part of an effort to try and sell Canada on uh, SMRs. Um, the um, uh, report from CNL sort of talked about four important points. Uh, they said, you know, the establishment of an SMR industry would lead to economic benefit for Canada. Secondly, it aligns with the commitment to combat climate change. Third, uh, they are considered an attractive solution for remote off-grid communities and industries operating in remote locations, such as mining. And lastly, they talked about enhanced safety. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the third point. And uh, when this came out, uh, a couple of colleagues and mine, uh, so I just want to say one more thing. This is not just from the CNL side. Uh, there are a number of uh, other um, uh, entities that seem to see uh, the uh, more remote areas in the north as a potential market for SMRs. Uh, so uh, a couple of colleagues of mine here uh, at UBC and I started doing some work last year uh, trying to see whether there is really a market for uh, SMRs and what does that mean. Uh, and we kind of ignored the desirability question for, question for now. Okay? Uh, these are very preliminary results, so please do not cite or quote or share yet. Um, but hopefully oh, by the end of uh, the summer, we will come out with a paper that uh, has final numbers and I'll be happy to share that with you. Um, what we basically did was to look at what are the exact number of mines and other things that are there uh, based on number of sources. We looked at some inclusion criteria, especially the fact that they are not connected to the grid. Uh, if they are connected to the grid, then they have access to all the other source of power. And we know a priori that SMRs and nuclear power don't make sense sense there. And then we sort of looked at, uh, you know, with how many actual mines are there and so on. And what we found is that there are about uh, 13 operational mines and there are about 11 mines that are under development, uh, which might come online within the next decade or so. Uh, and there are also some mines which are quite old, which might be shut down in a decade. So if you look at all of that, by 2028, we were estimating and we looked at how much capacity of uh, diesel generators that they most of them use at this point uh, are using. And we came up with numbers in the range of 500 to 600 megawatts of electricity. That's not a lot of power to start with. And the second thing to note is that most of the time these diesel generators are not being actually used. Uh, so uh, the average um, utilization of these reactors is going to be quite low. Okay, so anyway, you sort of, we did some number, number crunching here to find what is the average size of the diesel generators that are used currently, uh, what's the average peak demand and so on. And what you find is that assuming all the remote mines invest in small modular reactors, the energy demand would translate about 20 SMRs of 25 megawatt capacity each, right? Again, this is assuming, uh, this is a big assumption to assume that all these remote mines are going to invest in reality, most of them will not. Uh, in, uh, view of so many different considerations that we're all quite familiar with, but this is the kind of most optimistic number that you can provide to the nuclear industry. And a similar uh, analysis for remote communities that are not uh, connected to the grid yields around 200 SMRs of about 2.5 megawatt capacity each. These are much smaller reactors, and so the economies of scale are going to be much uh, higher, or diseconomies of scale are going to be much higher for 25 megawatt and even higher for the 2.5 megawatt reactors. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the talk in among those who are promoting SMRs is that you require what they call a full order book. And um, the Westinghouse CEO said, you know, for the 225 megawatt Westinghouse SMRs, you require about 30 to 50 
Otherwise, you're not going to make all the money that you spend on your development costs of these reactors and getting it through the license um, uh, process uh, in the NRC or CNSC. And so if you think about smaller reactors compared to 225 megawatts, you're going to require many more than 30 to 50, right? Probably an order of magnitude to two orders of magnitude higher uh, if you have to try and make up your money. And uh, so that's, so there is, I think, what this basically tells you, and this is where it's still very preliminary, I haven't done the number crunching yet. Uh, what you find is that the uh, uh, market estimates that we made are really not adequate to be a, a sufficient market to uh, set up an SMR uh, factory. Um, the uh, second thing that we did was to look at what would be the cost of generating electricity at these, uh, from these SMRs, uh, and you compared them with uh, the existing diesel uh, generators uh, and uh, solar and wind uh, uh, power plants. So solar and wind we used as only standalone without any battery backups and so on. So uh, you would have those uh, mines would have to have some diesel uh, in order to compensate for when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. Uh, but uh, what you see is that, uh, but that's going to be true also for a nuclear uh, uh, powered mine because the nuclear reactor might have to be shut down at some point, either because of uh, refueling or because of safety. So they will have to have the diesel backup there as well. So it's not really such an unfair comparison. Um, what you find essentially is that nuclear vastly outstrips um, all these other alternatives in terms of cost, which is not surprising, uh, but it's still sort of good to see what the order of um, the difference is. Okay, so let me conclude. I've talked already for too long. Uh, the, let me start by sort of reiterating the broad conclusion, which is that nuclear power is fading in importance in terms of contribution to global electricity generation. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to imagine, to, to think that SMRs will solve the problems of nuclear power, especially economics, but also many of the other ones could get accentuated. Uh, there is not enough market potential in mines or remote areas to justify building factories to make SMRs. Uh, basically, no uh, developer can actually recover all the costs that go into developing the design and getting it licensed. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there is not enough market in other countries as well. So it's trying to say that, oh, it's fine that only a few reactors are going to be built here, but then we will go and uh, export it to Indonesia or uh, Uruguay or, or whatever country they pick is, I think, not an argument that is tenable. Uh, and lastly, uh, electricity from SMRs will be much more expensive than other alternatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was uh, an excellent presentation. We've got a number of questions uh, or comments in the, um, in the chat box and uh, I'm showing my screen now. If you would like to ask a question, it, it, it'll be easier to manage our flow if you could put your hand up, but I'm gonna start off by going through the chat box. We did have a couple of uh, questions or comments as we went. Um, so we had a question uh, around um, the question around uh, the uh, so construction can, graph uh, around yeah, new reactors. So the, yeah. So the, this is the um, these are not new reactors. These are reactors that are listed as under construction at the beginning of each year. So it's an accumulation count, if you want to put it that way. And they sometimes include reactors that have been under construction for many, many long periods of time. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, just a couple of notes from Ola Hendrickson about activities uh, mm -hmm. and attitudes between Canadian Nuclear Laboratories and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And a question about if mining companies need to turn their uh, diesel generators on and off, uh, same with SMRs. And I think that point is addressed. A question from Dr. Edwards, do diesel costs, do your diesel costs include need to transport diesel fuel to remote? Yes, that, so these are, so the diesel costs are not um, from first principles. Uh, these are costs that are reported by different uh, mining companies and we kind of average that. So that includes the cost of uh, transporting diesel, yes. Great, thank you. And a question from Linda asking for Keith uh, Barnum, Professor Emeritus from Imperial College. 
Have you found any indication that an SMR would be easier and safer to load follow by virtue of its size? Um, so, so load following represent, um, is the term that's used for reactors that can vary their power output based on the demand. Um, currently, most reactors uh, in Canada and the United States uh, try to operate their reactors uh, at the same consistent power level. Uh, they do this for two reasons. One is uh, safety in the sense that when you do uh, vary the power output, there are both nuclear factors uh, which uh, have to be taken into account and um, the fact that uh, the thermodynamic stresses on some of the component parts uh, go up and down as you cycle up and down in, in temperature. Uh, and both of them are detrimental to safety. Um, uh, the other reason why um, utilities like to um, operate their uh, reactors in a, a flat out mode, what they call base load, is because um, that's the most um, efficient way of trying to recover their economic costs. So because you've spent a huge amount of money, uh, you would like to operate it as much as possible in order to recover the cost. And uh, because the fueling costs for nuclear power plants are much smaller compared to the capital costs. In contrast with diesel plants or peaking gas plants, the cost of the plant itself is not very high, but the cost of gas or the fuel in general is much higher. So if you want to have um, some kind of a generator that operates only for a very short period of time, so-called peaking loads, then it's better to use a high fuel cost, low capital cost plant. So these are the reasons why um, utilities don't use uh, reactors in uh, load following mode. Uh, mode. Uh, but uh, in some countries, especially France, um, because their uh, electricity sector is so dominated by nuclear power, they have to do load following because the electricity demand is not a base load demand. Demand goes up and down during the day, as we all know. Uh, and over the seasons, it varies a lot. Uh, so in principle, there is no reason why uh, reactors cannot be operated in uh, a load, load following mode, although there are some penalties with that. Penalties both sort of uh, for safety and for uh, uh, economic reasons. Uh, is, it, is it going to be, uh, is an um, SMR safer? The claim from the SMR industry is that these are designed from the beginning to be doing load following, and they do so in different ways. I've not really looked into the details of that, uh, but I would start with the presumption that uh, it's possible to operate them in load following mode, but there will be an economic penalty as is the case for large reactors. And given that SMRs are already economically challenged, when they operate in load following mode, their economics is going to be worse. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I've got questions from uh, Gordon Edwards and Russell Walker that I'm going to combine together. They sort of go together. And the first question from, from Gordon Edwards is around any studies around the difficulty of extracting and exporting uh, high-level waste from the small modular reactors. And uh, Russell's question follows on that around discussion more generally about um, by those promoting SMR about how they will handle the waste. Yeah. Uh, and then Gordon has a second question about decommissioning. Right. So um, the um, uh, usually the SMR in this, there, there are different kinds of SMRs, which are reactor designs, which all go under the name of SMRs. Uh, so there are some reactors which are uh, some reactor designs, I would say, not real reactors. These are all paper reactors at this point, or actually PowerPoint reactors for the most part. Um, what uh, they all uh, talk about is uh, those which are similar to light water reactors, uh, so like new scale, would basically say, we're going to do exactly the same thing that you do with uh, large reactors. Uh, so you know, by the time these are deployed, hopefully we will find a solution. And fingers crossed, there will be something like Yucca Mountain uh, or some site uh, in Canada, I guess, and in Northern Ontario, probably, uh, that will be uh, uh, receiving or ready to receive uh, nuclear waste and so the SMR waste can just as well go there all right uh, decommissioning will be essentially the same kind of issue so I don't think they would see this as different now however there are some SMR designs uh, which uh, would uh, which are what they call nuclear batteries or these are designs which are intended for especially this comes up in the 
context of the um, of these uh, reactors, which are um, intended for remote communities. Uh, there, the argument is we cannot keep having people there going in and uh, changing the fuel all the time and so on. So we're going to have reactor designs that will be fueled from the very beginning for their whole lifetime. And so the reactor was sent there with a full load of fuel. It stays there for 20 or 30 years, operates it generally. And then at some point, uh, there's not enough fuel, in which case you take in a new uh, unit there and maybe you bring the old unit back. Whether that old unit is brought back immediately or after uh, 50, 20 or 30 years of cooling, et cetera, et cetera. This is the level at which the discussion happens today. I'm not saying that this is easy, uh, or that it is going to be uh, straightforward, but that's the kind of uh, discussion you would see today. Okay. Thanks. A uh, question from Ol Hendrickson. Are you and your colleagues sharing your findings with the Minister of Finance and the House of Standing Committee on Finance, which recently recommended that ACL, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, invest in its publicly, provi invest its publicly provided assets in SMR development? Um, I... Uh, no, we are not yet finished with this work. Uh, I'm happy to share it with anybody uh, when it is done. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm seeing Gordon's question. And I, yes, I, I totally agree. I'm not trying to say that uh, used fuel is uh, easy to deal with. Uh, it's pretty hard to deal with even in light water reactors uh, or heavy water reactors today. Uh, all I think that the SMR industry would say is that we are no different from current reactors in any major way in, the, in this fashion. And I'll just add that is exactly what the Nuclear Waste Management Organization is saying. They uh, presented at the conference that launched the SMR roadmap last fall. And uh, you know the NWMO, Nuclear Waste Management Organization characterization, I would summarize by saying easy peasy, no problem. They deal with other waste, they can deal with this waste. So no really uh, uh, serious substantive response from the NWMO other than to say they can manage it. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I see you, Gordon, I see your point about remote communities posing special difficulties. I totally agree. Um, I'm not, uh, so I think these are all points that we need to, as the debate moves forward, we need to be highlighting. Uh, the work that I was doing was just kind of saying, let me look at the um, economics of it. Uh, and yes, absolutely, I agree. It will add to the cost. Yes. Uh, yes, people are still working on pebble bed modular reactors. So there are some um, designs that are out there. Um, I don't know if any of them have applied to CNSC. I, I, I didn't have time to look at who are the vendors that have submitted their designs. But globally, yes, there are pebble bed model reactor enthusiasts. Uh, so XC is one of them. Uh, the Chinese are building one of them. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Chinese are actually building a pebble bed model reactor in um, uh, Xiadong in uh, southern China. And uh, what's important about that particular uh, construction project is that that was supposed to be the first of many Chinese uh, pebble bed modular reactors. The Chinese have a, uh, a, a small uh, pilot one already near uh, Beijing in uh, operated by Tsinghua University. Now, uh, the large reactor that's being, the, the large meaning the 200, 200 megawatt reactor that's being constructed uh, was supposed to be the first of several and there were plans to construct 18 more at a different site. And that basically uh, evaporated when they saw uh, how expensive and how long it takes to construct the first uh, pebble model reactor. So I don't see the market outlook for them as being very good. Great, thank you. And a question from all about the Babcock Wilcox design. It was M Power was a light water reactor. It was not a molten fuel reactor. Great. In general, in the United States, all the reactor designs that are considered to be advanced and close enough to uh, licensing and deployment will be light water reactor designs. And um, that's actually one of uh, CNSC's uh, selling points, that they are more technology neutral. They are willing to look, look at different kinds of reactor designs. The problem there is that um, uh, the, 
sorry, US uh, SMRs are not, no, uh, most of them are um, uh, light water, uh, sorry, uh, pressurized water reactors, not boiling water reactors, this is to Gordon. Coming back to sort of the question of uh, different reactor designs and, and uh, licensing them, uh, the, the, one of the reasons why the NRC uh, is much, uh, has a much clearer set of guidelines for light water reactors is that they have 40 or 50 years of experience of dealing with uh, light water reactors, the various problems that occur with it and so on. Likewise, I would imagine that uh, CNFC should be saying, we know all about uh, heavy water reactors. We've been operating many of them for many years. And that's the re uh, reactor design that should have the priority. Uh, if you are trying to come up with a new design, uh, a molten salt reactor, for example, then what uh, CNSC has to do if it has to license that is actually go and train a bunch of people, maybe 20, 30, 40 people for several years on the details of that design, uh, learn all about how these operate and how they can go wrong, what kind of accident modes are possible. And that's a huge amount of investment. You're talking about tens of millions of dollars on just the regulatory staff to be able to evaluate a new reactor design, right? It is not a trivial matter to think, to look at a reactor design on paper and try to figure out what are the possible safety challenges that this particular reactor design are going to have. So in the absence of that kind of investment, what will happen is that the, um, the uh, uh, regulator will be uh, will sort of have to depend on the reactor um, uh, vendors to kind of come and say what our problems are and how we are so smart that you have figured out how to solve all these problems and why our reactor is so safe that you never have to worry about an accident. Uh, so that's, uh, it's not, I think, a, a good uh, design for any kind of uh, regulatory system. And yes, I agree. So CNSA is just enabling and supporting uh, government policy. Yes. And the question from Russell Walker about cost to produce electricity at Bruce and Pickering. Um, he says he insists the real cost is only 12 cents. Question for. Yeah. So I, so when you, when somebody says, what is the cost of generating electricity? You have to ask them a lot of questions about what does that mean? Right, so uh, there are broadly speaking two sets of costs. Uh, there is the what we call the levelized cost. That's the cost of everything in the whole, uh, the construction, the operation, the fuel, the decommissioning, and all of that sort of added up uh, using a sort of standard uh, discounting procedure uh, to try and come up with an average cost for the whole lifetime. Right, and then there is the just the mere operational cost. So imagine that your reactor has been constructed, uh, you've recovered your capital cost. What is the cost of generating each additional unit of electricity? That's called the marginal cost. My guess is when they say 12 cents, that's probably just the marginal cost, uh, which means it's the cost of the paying the workers there, the engineers there, and the fuel there. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, that's not really a uh, a fair comparison because in the at some point these reactors will have to be shut down. So if you in if you add, for example, the cost of refurbishment of Bruce and Darlington and so on, I expect that the costs are going to go up because those costs have to be recouped in some fashion. Great, thank you. And we have a, a comment from uh, Mitchell Marik about uh, micro nuclear reactor design for remote Canadian communities receives UK government funding. I'm wondering, Dr. Raman, if you could comment at all about the, the interconnectedness of, you know, the, the, what's the international web around SMRs like, and is it different from uh, more sort of standard operating react, current, the current fleet of reactors? Yeah, I think the you know the nuclear industry around the world is you know in 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 some ways competing with each other, but also collaborating with them. Uh, especially if you see the nuclear establishments in Western Europe and the United States and Canada, they and to some extent Japan, they tend to work a lot together. So I, it's not surprising to me that the UK government would give funding to uh, some reactor nuclear company in the UK which basically would go to the UK government and say, look, you know, we have this great design uh, and, you know, they can't make, maybe not make a case for 
deploying it in the UK. So they go and say, oh, we can go and deploy it in Canada. And because Canada's, you know, the CNSC has said we are going to be willing to do that. And I can imagine that the UK government is funding them. The UK government has been funding a lot of nuclear activities. And so I'm not surprised by this at all. Great. Thank you. Well, we've just passed 12 o'clock. I think uh, I'm seeing thanks registering into the chat uh, box. So I'm going to ask any final questions or comments? Yes, can you hear me, Dr. Ramirez? Hello? Charles, I think you maybe your system is frozen. I'm sorry, he doesn't seem to hear me. Yeah, go ahead yeah. now. Yeah, I'm not able to hear. Yeah. Uh, yes, Dr. Romana. First of all, uh, congratulations on a very well researched uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the issue that you, or one of the you did not address was sustainability. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of the concerns I have is that the whole light water industry is dependent <coughs> on UV5. Whereas to have a sustainable power system, we have to run off U238, which means we need a breeding cycle, which in practice means we need liquid sodium cooled reactors. <clears throat> so I, I've looked into this and to, I, I do not, like you, I do not see very small uh, liquid sodium cooled reactors as being viable. Uh, <clears throat> However, at the 300 megawatt size, it may be a different story in markets where there's no alternative. No alternative. And for example, uh, we're looking in Texas right now where they have a lot of wind, but they have one month a year when the wind dies right down. And that seems to be a common pattern uh, that's quite widespread, that is wind is not sufficiently reliable uh, to sustain a power system. So if, if the government is serious about shutting down fossil fuels, then there really is no alternative to nuclear for what I'll call critical uh, electricity applications. Charles, do you have and a Once you have the word critical, the issue of the <coughs> marginal cost uh, versus uh, the cost of uh, natural gas, for example, just becomes academic. So you, Charles? could you just explore your thoughts in this general area? Yeah, so I think this is a large topic and, you know, probably should be reserved for a different seminar. Can we have a, a, a renewable, I mean, a, an energy system that does not use fossil fuels um, that is reliable and uh, uh, is nuclear an essential part of that? I think that's a big topic. I think there is, it's a subject of much debate. Uh, I would say two things. I'd say that um, first, you know, when uh, the question of reliability of an inter of a renewable energy based system uh, started, maybe about 20 years ago, people would say the maximum amount of renewables in the grid could be about 20% or something, right? And as years go by, that figure has been going up and up and up. Uh, so the last set of studies from um, NREL, the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, talked about an 80% uh, renewable energy future, all right, of reliable grid with very minimal amount of backup. Um, and you've already seen in Western Europe, these numbers are already in some countries, it's up, up to 40 to 50%. So, um, and this is a, so it's a moving figure. So I don't, and globally, the amount of uh, electricity that comes from renewables is fairly small. So I think we have a long way to go before the kind of problems of intermittency and grid reliability are going to become real and technologies are going to change a lot. The second issue is if that is going to be some uh, remaining technology that is going to be required, is nuclear going to play that role? And uh, what I would say is that if you're thinking about nuclear power in a very heavily renewable energy based grid, then the nuclear reactor has to be essentially playing complement to a, a electricity source that is going up and down depending on whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Now, I'm not saying nuclear power plants cannot do that, but when they do that, their um, operating capacity factors are going to be much lower. 
So the economic challenges that we are talking about today are going to be much worse for them. Okay, and we can talk about this. Um, one last thing which I want to say in terms of the sustainability and this idea that we require to go to U-238 and breeder reactors. I think we have enough uranium to last us for decades, if not centuries, uh, even in the scenarios when nuclear power expands. That's what the general uh, estimates from, uh, you know, the IAEA's Red Book and a whole bunch of other sort of uh, uh, studies tell me. So I don't see a, a great uh, uh, requirement for uh, fast reactors uh, and breeder reactors in the near future. And uh, if anything, those reactors have a whole bunch of problems, which I think are make them worse uh, than, you know, current light water reactor fleet. But that's, as I said, that's a big topic. We should really have a separate discussion on that. Great. Well, thank you very much. A wonderful segue into a, another series of webinars. Uh, but thank you very much, Dr. Ramana, for today's presentation. Lots of great comments in the chat, and uh, we really, uh, really appreciate your time and your uh, expertise and your sharing that with us. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it was a pleasure talking to all of you, and I hope to keep continuing discussion with all of you. Bye, Linda. Thank you. Goodbye, all.